Okay, so thanks very much. Um, first, let me say it's a, a great pleasure to be here speaking about some of my favorite topics. Yeah, so um, <coughs> we're going to talk about uh, conformal geometry and tractors, whatever they are. Um, <coughs> let me just indicate roughly a bit of the plan. So uh, first of all, there's a, a sort of two parts. So part one and part two. <coughs> which are a little bit different in nature. Um, so, <coughs> part, part one is concerned with, well, sort of what, what conformal geometry is. First of all, let me say from the point of view of uh, perhaps this conference and also historically, um, why are people interested in conformal geometry? Well, <coughs> historically, I think that one of the main reasons was that um, it was observed that, th that uh, the Maxwell equations were conformally invariant and, um, <coughs> and subsequently that, that massive free field equations are conformally invariant. So it's thought that uh, conformal geometry has a, a, f a, a, a probably fundamental role in physics. <coughs> and around the same time it was noticed to be a sort of mathematically interesting structure. And it turns up in mathematics in lots of other ways to do with CR geometry and so on. So, um, <coughs> certainly plenty of mathematical motivation. So let, let's believe that conformal geometry is interesting. And then <coughs> um, one of the th main things we want to do in part one is, is develop a, a calculus, which is called tractor calculus. <coughs> <coughs> which is just an invariant calculus for conformal geometry, just, just as the levy sevier connection and so on gives an invariant calculus for Riemannian geometry. Um, the motivation that I want to give <coughs> in this part um, <coughs> is just uh, invariance and invariant operators. The, the point of view being really that if you want to do, for instance, analysis on some sort of geometry, <coughs> these are the basic tools you need to even start doing analysis. So, so if you can't do that, in a sense, you should give up. So, so we want to think of a reason for, for tr studying this as it is desire to treat these things. So, <coughs> um, and then there's a little bit of link to sort of famous and variant objects. <coughs> okay, and then <coughs> I'll, I'll sort of finish up part one by saying we're indicating how tractor calculus sort of solves these problems. I mean, of course... Uh, a complete solution is not so easy, although, well, to some extent it happens. Um, part two <coughs> is then about uh, what, what I'd call geometric compactification. And here, basically, I mean conformal compactification. Whoops, it's getting the wrong frequency there. Um, <coughs> so, but I want to think of it in a way that, in fact, generalizes, and that'll uh, be a little bit linked to the thing I'll talk about in the, in the conference subsequently, or the workshop. Um, <coughs> there'll, there'll be a, a link to um, Friedrich's <coughs> conformal system. Actually, this link could be made earlier. The, the, the system is very closely related to the tractor connection, um, or, the, or conformal field equations. Uh, <coughs> um, and then, uh, so amongst the topics will be the link between geometry versus the compactification. <coughs> By which I mean that um, your interior geometry actually constrains the way that you can compactify a manifold um, geometrically, and in particular conformally, if you want to do it that way. Um, li linked to this, there's the notion of hypersurfaces, or they play a role in, in compactification. <coughs> but it's sort of interesting in its own light. So I'll give one little lecture on how to do the conformal geometry of, uh, associated to hypersurfaces um, in conformal manifolds. <coughs> um, and then the part of the reason I want to do this at this point is we can come back and look at this conformal compactification and, and use this uh, to study the geometry of conformal infinity. <coughs> um, and, and then finally... Uh, I'll talk a little bit about a boundary calculus, <coughs> uh, which, <coughs> which you can use to study the asymptotics 
um, <coughs> sort of at the conformal infinity of, of boundary problems. Okay, so that's the that's our sort of aim. Now, <coughs> let me make a sort of preliminary remarks. <coughs> so first of all, let me say what I mean by a conformal manifold, although we're going to back away from this for a little while. So, <coughs> so <coughs> a conformal <coughs> by the way, I should have said also the, these lectures are meant to be completely elementary, so um, <coughs> You're, you're fully in, uh, I won't be offended if you sleep completely during the first few lectures because I want to start from the beginning. Um, so, <coughs> which many of you know very well. So, so I'll, I'll write a, an N manifold like this. So, for, so if, when I'm talking about conformal geometry, I'll usually assume that <coughs> N is at least three, um, <coughs> just because things are different when dimension is two, um, <coughs> and. Um, here it's just a smooth manifold, um, and C is your conformal structure. So, <coughs> so what C is is it's an equivalence class. So, conformal equivalence class uh, of signature. Crikey. <coughs> PQ metrics. So we'll, everything will apply in any signature. Um, and what that means is that if you've got two metrics um, in the equivalence class, <coughs> then, um, then they're related by a positive function. So, so G hat, and this is one of the ways, so I'll typically write this, is omega squared times G, where omega is a positive function. And it'll be <coughs> assumed C infinite. In fact, <coughs> everything that I talk about will be, will be C infinite. So, and that's what smooth will mean. <coughs> so smooth equals C infinite. <coughs> okay. Okay, so that's, so that's um, what a conformal geometry is, and that's what we want to be able to work on. This, this structure exactly, so not, in the end, not work on a remaining structure, be able, to, be able to work directly on a conformal manifold. And there's two reasons for doing that. <coughs> so, <coughs> so one is to, um, so, <coughs> so the reason for studying conformal manifolds <coughs> is to study things which happen to be conformally invariant. So study conformally invariant objects. <clears throat> or, or because we love conformal manifolds, maybe it's an interesting structure. So, so this is the sort of obvious reason for doing conformal geometry. Um, <coughs> it's a bit of a no-brainer. Um, on the other hand, <coughs> a more subtle reason is, is to use it to um, study pseudo-Romanian geometry. Let me write pseudo-Romanian like that. <coughs> um, <coughs> as, a, as a symmetry reduction... of conformal. So, and this is particularly important when, when perhaps secretly there's something conformal um, that you're interested in or, or that you think conformal geometry possibly plays a role in things. But <clears throat> my point of view is you can actually, you get a different perspective on pseudo-Romanian geometry by thinking of it as being conformal geometry plus some additional structure. <clears throat> There's a kind of dumb way of doing that. <laughs> you say, well, it's a conformal uh, structure, and then you put the scale back in. <laughs> okay, so that's not what I mean, of course. Um, so, <clears throat> okay. So I'll, I'll uh, hopefully clarify later on, um, and especially in the second, in part two, we'll, we'll talk about that. Okay, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so now I want to talk, first of all, about invariance and invariant operators. <coughs> and of course, in the end, we want to do this conformally. But let me start right at the beginning um, so, that we, so that we know what we mean by, by things like invariance. And the simplest example whatsoever starts with just an affine connection. 
<coughs> okay, so suppose you have a manifold and you have a smooth affine connection, then <coughs> one thing you can do is calculate its torsion, <coughs> which works. <clears throat> okay, so if you've given a couple of uh, vector fields, so smooth vector fields on your manifold, then the torsion is calculated by, you take the, the derivative of, of V in the direction of U minus the derivative of U in the direction of V minus the Lie bracket of those two. <clears throat> okay, so this looks like some sort of differential operator, but as you all know, this is actually a tensor So the torsion um, lives in, 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 well, it's a section of the, the, ten, the tangent bundle <coughs> with two forms. Okay, so, so, so this turns out to be a tensor, which is nice. Um, but what I wanna, want you to think of is, as, is, is the torsion as an invariant, which maps connections to their torsion. So <coughs> the, the nice thing about this is that this is defined in a completely natural way. There were no choices of coordinates or anything like that. So this is, <coughs> this is a, a natural thing that you can extract from, from connections. So if you have a smooth manifold, you put a connection on, you get its torsion, and it's a lot like taking the exterior derivative. So the torsion is, is a little bit like the exterior derivative of a connection. <coughs> well, in fact, it's a lot like that. <coughs> so this is this is a, a basic example of an invariant. <coughs> Another one, of course, is curvature. So, so suppose you have some vector bundle, <coughs> and you have a connection on this vector bundle. <coughs> then, um, you can form, form this, uh, this combination where you take, uh, so again, U and V are, are just smooth vector fields, so you apply this connection twice in the opposite direction, so that's the commutator bracket acting on some section of this vector bundle minus um, the derivative in the direction of the Lie bracket acting on there. And again, this is, this is a, um, some sort of tensorial type object <clears throat> which, which is a little bit of a surprise. This could be a second order operator, but things conspire so that you actually get a, ten, uh, a um, <clears throat> so you actually get a tensorial type object. <clears throat> and so you get a map from connections on vector bundles to their curvature. <clears throat> so on a smooth manifold, there is this this thing that you can construct. So, so I want to think of this invariant as that map. Okay, so those are, are, are examples of invariants. And in the pseudo-Romanian setting, for example, one wants to understand, yep. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, that's right. It's completely coordinate independent. That's, that's what we want. I'll, I'll get more precise about in Romanian, pseudo-Romanian geometry about what well, more precise. I'll be more specific about what um, we want an invariant to be. But this, this is clearly an invariant, right? So, <laughs> so <clears throat> which is the idea I want to get across. So, okay, there's a sort of subsection here which I might call Ricci calculus. <clears throat> this is the calculus that surrounds the levy sevier connection. So, so let's now start with a pseudo-Romanian geometry. <clears throat> Okay, some, some metric of some signature. Um, then the metric G determines <coughs> uniquely um, the levi sevier connection. <coughs> so this is the connection characterized by the fact that it preserves the metric and its torsion is zero. Whoops. Okay, so this, these things characterize it. <coughs> um, therefore, on a smooth manifold, <coughs> uh, 
<coughs> you have this map now which takes the mat track to the curvature of, <coughs> of the levi Savita connection. And that, that again is, is an invariant, this map. So, and by the way, let me, um, oh, I forgot to mention my abstract index notation. So, <coughs> I want to use abstract index notation. Let me put it over here in the corner. <coughs> Um, <clears throat> by which I mean this is the Penrose type abstract index notation. So I'll use this notation, curly E, for the trivial bundle. <clears throat> um, and, and on the other hand, for the tangent bundle, so <clears throat> we can write it abstract like that. I'm, not go I'm going to use index free or abstract index notation as convenient. So, so this is the abstract index notation where you put any, any Roman alphabet letter up here for the tangent bundle and then the dual. <coughs> and then contractions are written like, um, so if you had a one form acting on a vector, then <coughs> you, just, you just assign indices that tell you how the contraction is made. And that's all there is to abstract index notation. It's the same as index free. You, just <laughs> you can just rub out the indices um, if you know how the things act, right? That's the idea of abstract indices. There's not much going on. But what I wanted to say, so the way the curvature would look in abstract indices is um, <coughs> where you have uv acting on a vector w. This becomes <coughs> r-a-b-c-d u-a-v-b uh, w-d. Yeah, sort of... <coughs> This one doesn't have a nick. That's the same, same way of notation, no, denoting it. All right. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, so this, is, this is one invariant that you get, the curvature. And the question is, <clears throat> um, how about other invariants? So, <clears throat> um, can we make, uh, easily make other invariants in pseudo-Romanian geometry? And can we, in some sense, make all invariants in pseudo-Romanian geometry? So, well, it's easy to see where, make, where one can make other invariants. So, <coughs> so it's easy to see that we can at least proliferate invariants. All right, so for instance, the Ricci <coughs> um, curvature is just a contraction of the Riemann. So, um, whoops, <coughs> I don't, what's my convention? So, C... C, A, B. <coughs> so that's the Ricci curvature is made that way. That is an invariant of the metric. Um, the scalar curvature, um, <coughs> which is then G, A, B. So it's just the trace of Ricci, of course. Um, so these are invariants. <coughs> and then you can do things like this. So you can do the covariant derivative <coughs> acting on the curvature. So, so that is also an invariant of the structure. Um, so this is a tensor-valued invariant. <coughs> and then you can um, obviously contract things together. So, so you can do uh, Ricci AB, Ricci AB <coughs> times the scalar curvature or something. That would be a scalar invariant. <coughs> uh, and these are examples of, of what are known as vial invariants. So <clears throat> I don't want to completely go into, into the full details of vial invariants, but what are vial invariants are, are the um, invariants made uh, sort of polynomially using <coughs> um, the Riemann curvature, <coughs> its covariant derivatives, so it's levi Sevita <coughs> derivatives, so you can form things like this, and then, <coughs> and contractions, 
or partial contractions via the metric and its inverse. <coughs> okay, so those are vial invariants, and um, you can also use the volume form if it's oriented. So that's, a, that's both a definition of a type of invariant and instructions on how to make a lot, right? So you can, um, so you can proliferate. Oh, hang on, sorry. I'll, I'll go on to the next board. You can proliferate invariants by following those instructions. You take covariant derivatives of the Riemann curvature. Um, you contract some indices together and so on using the metric and the volume form. And those are called violent variants. So here's a question. <coughs> Do uh, all invariants arise as violent variants? <coughs> OK, well, to answer a question like that, you have to be more specific about what you mean by invariants. All right, so I haven't done that yet. So let me just, in the, in the case of scalar invariants, tell you what I mean. <coughs> So this is following, um, I, I, I think it's uh, a T about Patodis <coughs> in their heat kernel study. They, they needed to, to, um, um, <coughs> to, to look at the way of constructing all, all Riemannian invariants in a sense. So, so they wanted to study that problem as, as part of what they were doing. Um, <coughs> so a scalar <coughs> Riemannian invariant P, let's call it, um, is a function <coughs> um, which assigns <coughs> uh, to, to any pseudo-Romanian manifold, I think they were talking about Romanian in their setting, but it's the same idea, um, <coughs> a function that we'll call P of G, <coughs> which is perhaps what you'd normally call the invariant on M, <coughs> such that uh, one P of G uh, is natural. So this means it's coordinate independent, basically. So <coughs> um, if phi is some diffeomorphism of the manifold to itself, then P of uh, G, P, sorry, P of phi star G, so you can pull back the metric under the diffeomorphism and get a new metric, and this is the same as pulling back P of G, this function on the manifold. <coughs> okay, so that's saying it's coordinate independent. Uh, and the next thing is that <coughs> um, <coughs> it's polynomial, well, so P is given by a <coughs> universal uh, polynomial expression <coughs> when, you, you, when you're in charts. <coughs> so such that given local coordinates, <coughs> xi, um, p of g is polynomial <coughs> in, um, in the variables well, of course, the components of the metric, um, <coughs> and then and then their derivatives. So, the the first derivatives, <coughs> second derivatives, and so on, up to say the case derivatives. These are coordinate derivatives. My shorthand for that. So I one up to I k, gmn, <coughs> and then uh, and then we need the the determinant of the, basically the components of the metric inverse. <coughs> okay, which is available because a metric is, of course, uh, non-degenerate. <coughs> okay, so, so this for some <coughs> k positive integer. Maybe greater than equal to one. Oh, no, zero will do. <coughs> okay, so that's what... Um, 
<coughs> a scalar invariant would mean, so this, so this is, uh, produces a function on the manifold, and then you can easily adapt this to tensor valued. I'll just leave that as an exercise. <coughs> <coughs> but basically, th these are the main properties. It should be natural in this way, and then we have this restriction that it be more or less polynomial in the jets of the metric, um, except that you have to allow um, the inverse of the determinant. Yep. Oh, sorry. Thank you. <coughs> Okay, well then if we make that definition, <coughs> so I had this question, do all invariants arise as vial invariants, then yes. <coughs> okay, so this is called uh, Vial's classical invariant theory, or well, it's often quoted as that. <coughs> vial really... Um, answered the, the related algebraic problem to do with a, groups acting on a vector space. Um, and then on top of that, you need to use uh, normal coordinates and information about that and so on. Um, but in, in principle, um, Vial's theory gives you this result. Okay, so, <coughs> so in the following, I'm going to take Riemannian invariants or pseudo-Riemannian invariants to be Vial invariants. So I'll just, just think of them now as these sort of contractions made out of the, the, uh, the curvature and its covariant derivatives and so on. <coughs> okay, what about invariant operators? <coughs> so those are invariants. What about invariant operators? Um, <coughs> so similarly, <coughs> The Ricci calculus, <coughs> namely this calculus that comes out of the levi sevita connection, um, <coughs> uh, gives, gives all of these. <coughs> gives the natural differential operators. For example, the Laplacian, <coughs> which for me is going to mean um, the contraction of the levi sevita connection with itself, that's the sign convention, everything, not that the convention will make makes difference. And let's think of this as a, um, a thing that takes <coughs> uh, acts on sections of the trivial bundle and ends up in sections of the trivial bundle. Um, <coughs> you can also um, make natural operators, you can bring the curvature in, so you could do um, R, A, B, C, D, grad C, grad D, and this would be an operator, for instance, that might take the trivial bundle to um, this bundle. <coughs> um, so what do I mean by this bundle? This, this is just to illustrate the <coughs> abstract index notation. This, these round brackets means the symmetric part. And when we write a juxtaposed indices, that just means the tensor product <coughs> like that. Okay, so... <coughs> um, so again, with, if you make suitable definitions about what you want um, an invariant operator to, uh, to be, it being natural and so on, um, <coughs> if, you, if you make things specific enough, then all of the natural differential operators on a, on a pseudo Riemannian manifold are made in the obvious way uh, from the Ricci calculus. So, <coughs> so using the levi sevita connection, um, the curvature, making coefficients involve the curvature and so on. The coefficients of these natural invariant operators are themselves invariants. That's the point. <coughs> okay, so, <coughs> so the point is that, that basically, um, as I said, these invariants <coughs> and invariant operators <coughs> are, the, are the 101 of, of, of differential geometry. So so you need it for global analysis. <coughs> if you want to do geometric PDE, spectral theory, and physics, <laughs> then you need, you need a good um, basic calculus um, 
a b basic calculus that, that gives you invariants and variant operators. Okay, so, so what we want to know then is how do we do this for conformal geometry? Well, I said that a conformal manifold was a manifold equipped not with a metric, but with an equivalence class of metrics. <clears throat> and that, that equivalence class messes you up right at the start because you don't have a preferred levy sevita connection, um, and so you don't automatically get a calculus on the tangent bundle. So, so you're initially stuck until you find some replacement. So, <clears throat> but let's think of sort of motivating problems. <coughs> So one of them is to generate <coughs> um, or construct <coughs> perhaps all, that would be the best, right, local invariants. <coughs> of a conformal manifold. So there's we, we, well, invariant's going to mean the obvious thing. So just as a Romanian invariant um, is, a, is a natural coordinate independent object that you get canonically from your structure, when you start from a conformal manifold, you want, <coughs> you want to find the, the canonical invariant things that are produced by the conformal structure without choosing a, a specific metric, right? These should be just there somehow. Um, <coughs> and in fact, um, <coughs> we can... We can um, get them from, from uh, well, you know, this is one way to think about it. You first of all construct pseudo Romanian invariants, and then you look amongst those and find ones that are perhaps conformally invariant. So that's a sort of strategy you can try. <coughs> and then problem two is the same thing for invariant operators. Okay, well, we're not going to answer these uh, completely by any means. <coughs> um, however, I would like to get to the point where you would perhaps think that you could then set about trying to answer it, <laughs> right? So, so we can at least hope to get that far. Now, let's, before we do that, let's, let's attack this naively. So, <coughs> which is basically <coughs> the way I just described. So... So we'll look at how the levy sevita connection changes under conformal transformations and work from there. Okay, so, <clears throat> so you look at conformal transformations. <clears throat> okay, so remember we said that <clears throat> the metric determines the levy sevita connection. <clears throat> Good. Okay, then in local coordinates... <coughs> um, and when, remember we write, <coughs> I'm using this sort of shorthand, um, then this connection in, in local coordinates is determined by its connection coefficients, which are usually called um, Christoffel symbols in this case. <coughs> and um, the IJK, IJK component is just uh, dxi of the connection um, acting in the jth direction on the ith coordinate vector. <coughs> okay, so um, these are the basic objects determining the connection. And then by the Cazor formula, <coughs> there's an explicit formula for this um, <coughs> in terms of the metric, which looks like this. <coughs> Where, of course, these components, which I've already used that notation above, are just the <coughs> components of the metric. <coughs> 
Okay, so, so this tells you explicitly how the levi sevita connection arises from the metric, so it's then, of course, not difficult at all to compute how the levi sevita changes. So, <coughs> um, <coughs> so if we replace the metric by <coughs> some function squared times the metric, <coughs> um, and then we, um, and I'm going to use this notation, this is called epsilon, <coughs> popularized by Roger Penrose as, <laughs> as the thing to describe the um, such changes. <coughs> so it's almost just the exterior derivative. It's the log exterior derivative of the conformal factor. That's what it is. <coughs> um, <coughs> so th these are going to be in a bad position. Okay, let me... Well, let me put it here, and we'll have to remember it. Okay, so uh, I should be on the top board now, but anyway. Um, <clears throat> so, so now we can calculate how the connection changes, and it's very easy. So, um, <clears throat> so the, the hatted levi sevita connection acting on a vector, I'm using abstract indices here, is <clears throat> the unhatted one um, plus... Uh, epsilon A V B minus epsilon B V A plus the Kronecker delta um, and then epsilon dot V where I'm going to use the shorthand this just means V A epsilon A <coughs> whoops or dually um, if you act <clears throat> on um, on forms, then this is minus epsilon a omega b minus b omega a plus uh, gab uh, a form. <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah, sorry. I, so that's right. <clears throat> so we, we use the metric to, to raise and lower indices in the usual way. <clears throat> sorry. I thought if I was hanging around with relativists, it would be almost illegal to not do that. So. <laughs> okay. So, so now we know how the levi sevita connection changes under conformal transformation. We can compute how the curvature changes and so on. And in principle, it's not hard to try to make things that are unchanged when you make a conformal transformation. So, <clears throat> um, let me just... No, I better work on this board because <clears throat> I want those formulas to be visible. Okay, well, let's, let's start with the simplest possible things, right? So, <clears throat> so, but yeah, so the idea is now we, we could try to study, uh, look for conformal invariants and conformal invariant operators by simply using these formulae and trying to find things that are unchanged under a conformal transformation. <clears throat> In fact, until, until about the, the, the um, sort of early, mid-1980s, that was the only way people were, were really making invariants. It wasn't, well, making invariants in this explicit way, let's say. There were, there were, there were very deep and important constructions before that, but, but actually using them to answer these questions that I'm talking about was not done using those key and important constructions. <coughs> so, so let's do it. So, <coughs> for example, um, notice that, that this thing is symmetric in AB. The metric symmetric. This has been symmetrized, so certainly the skew part of this is invariant. So, so if you take a one form and you do this, <coughs> that's certainly conformally invariant. <coughs> 
And of course, before you all scream at me, yes, I do know that's the exterior derivative. So this is, <coughs> is just d of omega. Okay. So, um, so we didn't really find anything interesting. So, so this is, of course, defined without using a metric at all. It's just there on a smooth manifold. So <coughs> d of omega on a couple of vector fields <coughs> is, is um, u differentiating the function you get by um, acting with the one form on the vector field minus the other way around <coughs> minus uh, the one form meeting the lead bracket of the vector fields. So this, this doesn't use the, the, any connection and any torsion free connection will recover um, the exterior derivative by that formula. <coughs> okay, so let's try a slightly more sophisticated example. So, <coughs> um, but first of all, So suppose we want to compute how this acts on, on tensor powers of things, right? So this is, <coughs> this is the um, uh, second exterior power of the cotangent bundle. How, does the, how, does the, how do we use these formulae to compute the conformal transformation on that? Well, you just look at how it acts on simple things. Okay, so take a simple object, and then, of course, by the Levy uh, by the uh, Leibniz. Whoops. Okay, and now you can use that formula over there, and that tells you how to because all all um, sections of this bundle, this um, second tensor product of the cotangent bundle. Um, are, are just functional combinations of simple things. So if you know how the transformation is here, um, <coughs> then you know how it is um, <coughs> on, on this bundle. So, so here, let's take something in there. So, um, <coughs> so take F, A, B to be a section in there. Then <coughs> um, we want to... So by the way, when I put the hat here, it means the same as doing that, right? So... So if I want to do um, <coughs> calculate this thing, then I get that it's grad A FBC minus two times epsilon A FBC minus epsilon B FAC uh, minus epsilon C FBA plus <coughs> epsilon D FAC uh, oh, whoops FDC G a, B, plus epsilon D, F, B, D, G, A, C. Okay? So you can see that this is just computed by the Leibniz action. There's two of these because there's one for each index. Right? So that one occurs for each index because if you think of how it would come when you do with simple things, and similar with the other terms. So you just <coughs> compute it from, the, from there. Okay. <coughs> well... Once again, you can observe that, that um, <coughs> if you took the skew part on the right-hand side, it will kill all these terms. So, so 3 grad A FBC <coughs> um, is invariant. I'll just say invariant, but I mean conformally invariant. <coughs> but of course, if F was skew, I didn't say it was skew, <coughs> that's just df. So really the only content in saying that that's conformally invariant is the observation now that the exterior derivative on f is conformally invariant. Okay, so, but we can break out of it, so, um, <coughs> but now let's take uh, f to be skew. So I'll write this as a shorthand for the second exterior power of the cotangent bundle. So suppose uh, f is a section in there, or sections of that actually. <coughs> okay, so then let's look at this. Okay, so I want to take the sort of divergence of f. <coughs> um, so what this means, of course, is that we contract with the hatted metric inverse grad hat a f b c. <coughs> okay, and now we can use our formula to compute what we get, <coughs> uh, and we get an omega to the minus two grad b f b c <coughs> plus. 
plus, um, I'll just write it down first, n minus 3 epsilon d fdc plus uh, epsilon d fc d minus epsilon c fbb. Whoops, sorry, that one's not there because I said it was skew already. Um, and then I said that this was skew, so actually I can bring this term into here, and that gives me an n minus 4. Okay, so, so what we see is that, it's all gone now, um, that this, this divergence of f um, is, is this um, conformal factor to the minus 2, and then this expression in here, and so what we find is that in dimension 4, we've found something. <coughs> something you already knew, of course. <coughs> Let, let's... Let's celebrate, we'll call it a proposition, um, <coughs> if n equals 4, then, <coughs> um, <coughs> then for f a, b, which is a two-form, um, <coughs> we have this invariant operator here <coughs> is conformally invariant. Well, in fact, it's conformally covariant. It's <coughs> the language I want to use. Um, I want to say conformally covariant because of this, uh, <coughs> this factor here. Um, <coughs> so grab B, F, B, C. When we hat this thing under a conformal transformation, we get omega to the minus 2 grab B, F, B, C. <coughs> okay, so, um, <coughs> and we also see that um, if, if, we, if U was a, fun uh, a one form, <coughs> then um, w we could we could do this because this is just the exterior derivative of the one form, and then so now we get a two form, and, and this thing is conformally invariant or covariant. <coughs> okay, well this covariance is a little bit annoying because there's this factor here, but at least we see that the equations are good, right? So equations. Good. <coughs> so um, if you have grab B, F, B, C equals zero, then it certainly implies that the hatted one is zero and so on. And of course, this is, this is um, if you think of this um, <coughs> as, as a, um, a field, or the, or the electromagnetic field, then this is the Maxwell um, that the, uh, so, so, <coughs> So df equals zero, and this sort of divergence of f equals zero. Um, it's the field formulation of the Maxwell equations. <coughs> okay, so we, we're just seeing this famous um, invariance of the Maxwell equations, and this this would be the the version you use for the potential version of the Maxwell equations. <coughs> okay. Um, <coughs> Okay, well, I almost want to finish there, but let's say um, <coughs> what we also showed, apart from the fact that, um, that this is invariant when n is 4, <coughs> um, grab B, FBC <coughs> is not conformally invariant <coughs> if n is not equal to 4, okay? So, <coughs> this, this is a sort of um, perhaps depressing uh, sign because <laughs> um, sort of R conformal invariance rare. <coughs> okay, or sort of R invariant operators rare. <coughs> it's the same comment for invariance, but invariant operators. Differential invariant operators, <coughs> are they rare, conformally invariant ones? Because this only worked when the dimension was 4. Um, so this is a point I want to come back to. So is it, you mean conformal covariance or? 
Uh, covariant, yeah. I'll, st <coughs> I'll stop using the word covariant soon, as you'll see why. Um, so I'm not, I'm not used to using it. But basically, um, yeah, even, even this conformal covariance in that sense is rare. Um, <coughs> okay. Let me start. Uh, that was what I had in the first one. But let me start the next one a little bit because later on I'll be short of time. Okay, so what, what about the same sort of thing for invariance, right? So, so we want to use <coughs> this um, transformation of the levi sabater connection to find invariance. <coughs> <coughs> okay, well, we, we already observed <coughs> that... Um, a, a pseudo Riemannian manifold determines canonically this Riemannian curvature, ABCD. <coughs> and then, as probably most of you know, this can be split into a completely trace free part, which is called the Weyl curvature. So this is trace free. <coughs> So it's trace-free in all senses. So if you write, um, if you write it in the sort of more correct way like this, then certainly tracing C into these, any of these indices gives zero. But it's also metric trace-free. So if you contract it with the metric, you get zero. So it's completely trace-free, um, <coughs> plus some other part. So this is the trace part. So 2G C A. <coughs> So this is the trace part. <coughs> and this is, this is how you should think of this division initially into the trace free part and the trace part. And so this defines this object here, which is called... <coughs> so this is symmetric, so... Um, this is the Scouten tensor. <coughs> and of course, um, if, your, if your more favorite object is the Ricci tensor, then in dimensions uh, greater than or equal to 3, this is, this is um, just a trace adjustment of that. So, so Ricci AB equals n minus 2, n being the dimension of our manifold, uh, times the Scouten plus... J G A B, where this is my, our notation for the trace of Scouten. So. <coughs> okay, so um, the Scouten tensor has the same status uh, as the Ricci tensor, but it's a, uh, you can think of it as a trace adjustment of that. So here's an exercise, uh, <coughs> mainly an exercise because I don't want to bother going through such a long calculation on the board. But, um, so show that, <coughs> first of all, the vial tensor is itself conformally invariant. I put all the indices on. So, <coughs> um, and the Scouten tensor transforms like this. And this is quite important for us. Uh, oops. Whenever I use epsilon, it always means that same thing. So it's that, <coughs> that log derivative of the conformal factor. Um, <coughs> and so by epsilon squared, I mean epsilon dot epsilon, which remember means 
upsilon c, upsilon c. So just a contraction of that with itself. So I'll use that shorthand <coughs> uh, quite a lot. Okay, so, <coughs> so right away you see you can make some conformal invariants quite easily because the vial curvature itself is conformally invariant. Um, so if you want to make one scalar one, you can just take the length of the vial curvature squared. <coughs> okay, so if you hat that, so contract everything using the, the hatted metric and you take the vial curvature for the hatted one, of course this bit doesn't change. So all the transformation just comes from <coughs> using the inverse metric and so on to contract this together. So you get... <coughs> So this is a um, conformal covariant of, of a sort of weight minus four or something, right? So, <clears throat> oh, and by the way, um, <clears throat> something we're going to need um, <clears throat> that, that will be even worth you writing down is um, <clears throat> we can also trace this using the metric and compute. Uh, sorry, not that one. Where's this one? <coughs> the, um, the transformation of the Skelton tensor, so something we'll need in the next lecture, <coughs> is this thing. So J of G hat, so the trace of Skelton transforms like this, omega to the minus 2, <coughs> J minus J at A, epsilon A, plus 1 minus N on 2, epsilon squared. <coughs> okay, so, so that's one exercise. Um, and then here's, here's the next bit of the exercise. Make some higher order conformal covariance. <coughs> okay, so, so that'll you have to start with computing at least this, right? So, and then play around and try to make some. So that's an exercise. But it's also a sort of joke, right? <laughs> because what, what you'll quickly discover is you, you've got a page of upsilons <laughs> um, to start with. And, and <clears throat> you know, where you go from there, well, if you have some software, you can probably make invariants up to, say, order four or five or something like that. And then even your software will start having trouble. So things really blow up exponentially. So, <clears throat> so one of the points I want to get to is that <clears throat> using this as a way of producing covariance is completely hopeless practically, apart from the fact, of course, you learn nothing doing it that way. So, so we want to uh, do these things in a way where we learn something and you can really do it. <laughs> right, okay, I'll stop there. That's a good point. Okay, let, let's now return to uh, making invariant operators. So uh, let me see, where shall I start? Maybe in this middle bit. <coughs> okay, so... <coughs> so operators here will always mean differential operators, um, <coughs> these sort of local objects. Um, so, so if we have some sort of vector bundle, well, vector bundles, u, <coughs> u and v, <coughs> we want to find um, perhaps these are natural bundles or something like that, perhaps uh, irreducible tensor or spinner bundles and so on. Um, <coughs> we want to find uh, operators <coughs> which go between them. Um, and if we're going to adopt this point of view of uh, studying, with studying with Riemannian objects or pseudo-Riemannian objects, and then seeing how they change, then, then this, <coughs> we might initially define it with some metric, and then what we want perhaps is that this thing <coughs> is equal to that thing. That would be ideal. So if we had a, <coughs> certainly if we had a pseudo-Riemannian differential operator, natural one that went between those bundles, and it had this property, then we would say that it was conformally invariant. Okay, so that's our sort of aim. <coughs> Let's look at the uh, Laplacian. So, <coughs> obviously, an important object. So, what happens? Um, so, first of all, certainly on a pseudo Riemannian manifold, we get this Laplacian, which, remember, 
for us is defined like that. <coughs> where, where I'm using the, the metric to raise indices. Okay, so this is at the moment just a thing that maps functions to functions. <coughs> um, so what, what are the conformal properties of this? Okay, so let's take f to be um, a function, so it's a section of the trivial bundle. Um, <clears throat> that means that uh, grad a f is really just df, so, so this is conformally invariant, <clears throat> so, so, so there's no problem there. <clears throat> and therefore, if we use the formula which is just hiding under the board down there, um, <clears throat> then we can see we can calculate uh, how the transformation goes. So, so the Laplacian for the hatted metric acting on F, so this is going to be uh, G inverse AB on <coughs> grad, the, the hatted levy sevita connection acting on grad B of F. <coughs> okay, and then this is just some one form. So this is exactly that formula that we had. <coughs> uh, so we get grad A grad B F minus epsilon A, grad B F minus epsilon B, grad A F um, plus G A B um, epsilon C, grad C F, <coughs> like that. And then this is, this is the inverse metric, so uh, the hatting of that is just, uh, <coughs> I'll make it to the minus two of the inverse of the original metric. <coughs> okay, so now we can just compute that out. And, and what we get is that grad g hat f equals <coughs> Laplacian g f with a omega to the minus 2. Um, Okay, so, so we, we, when we contracted, we got an n from here and then minus 2 from there. So that, that's a very easy calculation. And so we get <coughs> um, this proposition now. We, we celebrate with the proposition that this thing <coughs> uh, is conformally invariant if and only if n equals 2. Okay? Of course, it's well known that the Laplacian is conformally invariant in dimension 2 which is important in complex analysis, of course. Um, <coughs> and what we also find is, again, alarmingly, that's the only dimension that it's conformally invariant in. <coughs> now, of course, so it's reminiscent of that thing that happened with Maxwell. Now, of course, you've all heard of the conformal wave operator, the conformal Laplacian, so, that, so there must be a sort of way out of this, right? So that's what I want to talk about next. Um, <coughs> so... <clears throat> but, but, yeah, so w without that way out, we would be stuck here. Now, <clears throat> how does the way out start? Well, you might say, well, let's try adding some curvature or something <laughs> to, to the Laplacian, and, and that'll hopefully make things better, right, so that it might become conformally invariant. But actually, <clears throat> okay, we, we know now, we know Viles invariant theory, um, <clears throat> and so you look at your list of available curvature objects, and, and what curvature could you add to get rid of this term? You can't, right? <laughs> this is epsilon hooked into the derivative of f. So you can't get rid of that term by adding a curvature. So <coughs> adding a curvature is something we will do, but, but we have to also do something else to get rid of that curvature. Okay, so <coughs> that object, so that thing there. So let's, let's call this a strange move. <coughs> because I think it was exactly how it was done originally, and we'll turn this into maths later on. So we'll replace <coughs> f by a sort of f of g. So f will be allow allowed to depend on the metric in the conformal class. Okay, so, <coughs> so if, um, <coughs> well, so <coughs> if you're on mg, you have f of f of g, and then this will be uh, somehow equivalent to f g hat, <coughs> which will be omega to the 1 minus n on 2 times f <coughs> on mg hat. 
<coughs> with the hatted metric, which is omega squared g. <coughs> okay, so we'll, we'll insist that the, the f rescales that way. As I say, this looks a little bit like we've, we've gone out of the realms of mathematics um, and into a kind of panic, but, <coughs> but let's, uh, let's do it anyway and see if it helps. <coughs> right, so then, <coughs> so, so grad hat A F, if we, if we sort of hat that, what we'll really mean is <coughs> we'll, we'll just take the, the levy sevity connection acting on functions, but we'll act on this F G hat, <coughs> which is going to be omega to the 1 over n minus 2 <coughs> times F, right? So, <coughs> by the way, when I write operators like this, they act on everything to the right. So I don't, you know, so, so one might otherwise put brackets around that. <coughs> okay, so, so now you calculate this out, and you get omega to the minus n on 2 times <coughs> grad a f plus 1 minus n on 2, <coughs> this log derivative of, up, uh, of uh, omega <coughs> times f. Okay. Okay, good. And now we put this into our formula. So, so <coughs> we put this into the, the formula for this thing. So, <coughs> and and uh, so now this is going to be uh, omega to the minus two GAB. That's the hatted inverse metric um, <coughs> contracted into grad B hat acting on this thing here. So. <coughs> Okay, good. <coughs> now the page starts getting messy, so, so I'll leave it as an exercise to put the dots in. It's only about, you know, half a page to a page. It depends, depends how small your writing is. Um, but <coughs> anyway, it, it does get messy, but it's not too bad. People survived it. So, <coughs> um, so, so here this fact of, you know, one thing that will come out, we'll get a minus 1 minus n on 2. That's clear. And then <coughs> when the dust settles, what you get is uh, Laplace and F in here, the old one, plus 1 minus n on 2, <coughs> uh, grad A epsilon A plus epsilon squared n over 2 minus 1. <coughs> uh, yeah, all of that times F. So, I need a bracket. Okay, good. Which, which is a lot better... <laughs> than what we had um, here, because <coughs> here we had this derivative of f, which we can't fax by adding some sort of curvature, and now this strange move has got rid of all the derivatives of f in that formula. So we could, if we were lucky, find some curvature to add to that that would, that would make this uh, go away. And in fact, there is. So, um, <coughs> so uh, let me see, I can actually dig it out. Oh, here it is. So, <coughs> so recall, <coughs> I, said, I said you might want to write this down. We found that JG hat, so this is the trace of Scouten, is omega to the minus 2, J minus uh, grad A epsilon plus 1 minus N on 2 epsilon squared. <coughs> Okay, so, <coughs> okay, the, <laughs> I've written things for slightly different, so, you know, made it as confusing as possible, but you can see that, that that mess there looks a lot like this mess here, all right? So, indeed, those messes cancel out, and, uh, <coughs> and so, so if we form this thing, I'll call it box G here. So um, this is going to be uh, Laplacian G plus w 1 minus N on 2 uh, JG. <coughs> um, <coughs> or uh, put another way, so you recognize the formula, plus N minus 2 over 4 N minus 1 scalar of G. <coughs> this object here 
is conformally covariant, in a slightly different sense, whoops, it's that one. <coughs> um, so this, this thing is called the um, conformal Laplacian. Or if you usually work in Lorentzian signature and have a sort of bias that way, you may call it the conformal wave operator. Um, <coughs> or if you're into curvature prescription, you may call it the Yamabe operator. Um, so this thing is conformally covariant in the sense that <coughs> um, So what you find is that box g hat of, and this is the strange move bit here, 1 minus n on 2 equals omega to the 1 minus n on 2 box g. <coughs> <coughs> okay, so here I'm thinking of these powers of omega as multiplication operators. Uh, minus 1, sorry. Is that better? <coughs> so, <coughs> um, <coughs> yeah, so it, it, it kind of has good conformal properties in that sense. So, <coughs> so more generally, um, and this is a definition that you'll see a lot in the literature. Um, let's bring this down again. let's say this is a pseudo Riemannian manifold, um, we say that a natural linear operator <coughs> is um, conformally covariant if P of G hat composed with some power of <coughs> the multiplication of some power of uh, Omega, the conformal factor, equals <coughs> omega, some different power uh, of P of G. <coughs> and these weights, the W1 and W2, we, we call them weights typically, um, they can be, for instance, real numbers. <coughs> Sometimes people can take complex powers as well and so on. Um, and, and by here, so this is a, um, a linear differential operator, but I don't necessarily mean that the, the domain and target bundles are the same. So, domain <coughs> Okay, so, and, and, and here's an example. Um, so this can be another exercise. Uh, <coughs> it's a pretty easy one. So it's not, this is not a joke one, it's actually a useful one. So show that this operator here, so I'll call it AG, um, which is going to take functions to um, symmetric trace-free uh, two tensors, <coughs> um, and it's given by <coughs> um, F gets mapped to um, a sort of the Hessian, the trace-free Hessian acting on F plus <coughs> the trace three part of the scout tensor times F. So this is, um, is covariant, conformally covariant with, let's say, by weight <coughs> uh, W1, W2 equals 1, 1. <laughs> okay, so in that case, the W1 and W2 are the same and they're 1. <coughs> um, Sometimes people say by degree. Sometimes for this operator they would say it was 1 minus 1 because the way they count those things is different and so on. Um, but <coughs> roughly speaking you'll find that. Yep. yep. That's a question? 
Oh, wait, W1, W2. Here? Oh, it's, uh, sorry, that's a one and a two. You're right. Sorry. Sorry. Trace three. Yeah. Yeah. So I said, yeah, trace three. So this is, um, yeah, I don't know. So trace three S2. <coughs> sorry. Okay, so um, this this sort of uh, notion of this so this this has been used a lot um, as a way to dealing with um, conformal operators and so on. Um, <coughs> we want to move in a slightly different direction. So, <coughs> or at least explain what's going on in that. <coughs> Okay, so conformal <coughs> Okay. So recall um, we had this notion of a conformal manifold, <coughs> and this is just this uh, conformal equivalence class. <coughs> of metrics. <coughs> okay, so um, what we really want to do is write down, <coughs> we want to write down operators that are just well-defined on a conformal manifold. <coughs> so in the end, rather than this sort of covariance business, um, <coughs> we want to just be able to write down things that are well-defined on a conformal manifold, because now we believe and love conformal manifolds, so we should be able to do calculus on them. <coughs> so, um, <coughs> so, so one question is, do these conformally covariant operators <coughs> descend <coughs> to these conformal manifolds? <coughs> well, of course, we'll see they do. Um, that's good. But, but we want to understand sort of how they do that. So, so we want, as I say, just operators that send some bundle to some other bundle that, that, that are well defined. So conformally invariant on a conformal manifold just means well defined. It doesn't mean anything else, right? Except, of course, you may get specific about it being polynomial in the jets of the metric or something. But in the first instance, we want some well defined things. <coughs> okay. Um, so so, so we, this is a sort of obvious request that we be able to find these things. <coughs> and then it's, it's related to, so <coughs> what's the strange move mean? So what's... <coughs> the strange move. Okay, so it's a bit annoying asking our function to depend on the metric um, because that's not normally uh, how we think of the functions. So, so what was really going on? Okay, so this brings us to the notion of conformal densities. <coughs> which are really very naturally part of the, the flora and fauna on conformal manifolds. So um, and you'll see why it becomes important there rather than on a Riemannian manifold. So, <coughs> so the, the starting point for this is <coughs> another way to think of a conformal manifold is that <coughs> it's equivalent to a certain bundle over our manifold. So here's our, man our original manifold M. <coughs> and a conformal structure is the same as equipping it with a certain ray bundle Ray meaning the, the fiber is R plus. <coughs> so what is this bundle? Well, it's just a bundle of conformally related metrics over the original manifold. So this is the principle. Why is it principle? Well, it's principle because R plus is a group under multiplication, right? So we have that group acting um, <coughs> R plus bundle <coughs> of conformally related metrics. Okay, so then, 
<coughs> um, so we can think of this as sitting inside um, the symmetric ten tensor power of the cotangent bundle um, as a ray subbundle. <coughs> Oops. <coughs> with fiber, just to be concrete here, um, x, uh, gx, <coughs> um, <coughs> for all uh, gx, a member of cx. <coughs> so this is with this is with fiber over x. Okay, so these. So, these, so there's the point downstairs and an element of CX, and so these are going to be related um, by multiplication by uh, positive numbers. So R plus acts <coughs> by, and let's make some notation for this. So here's R plus, here's an element S, um, <coughs> and it's going to go to uh, rho to the S GX will mean um, S squared. Ah, GX. Okay, so, so, so R plus X by, by taking the square of uh, your positive uh, thing. Just, just taking the square is just a sort of convenient um, convention and multiplying it into the, into the metric. <clears throat> okay, so a conformal structure can be just as easily thought of as just a manifold equipped with this ray bundle. So it's very much part of the structure. <coughs> and so things that come naturally with that are things that come naturally. <coughs> and in particular, we get associated line bundles. Okay, so, so we'll, we'll denote these um, like this, EW over M. So this is a line bundle, um, <coughs> and here uh, W is just, say, a real number. Um, <coughs> and these are associated, well, we have a principal bundle, so <coughs> this is the associated bundle that comes from some representation, I'll call it rho sub w <coughs> uh, on R. <coughs> okay, and this is the representation that takes this uh, S, <coughs> um, which is in R plus, <coughs> and maps it to an endomorphism of R, so rho w s uh, acting on an element of R, so this is an R is just um, s to the minus w times t. Okay, so this positive number to that power times t. So that's a representation on r. Um, <coughs> this r plus is, a, is the group acting here. So you get these associated bundles just for free. They're just canonical. <coughs> OK. Let me, let me remind you a little bit about associated bundles, just in case you're not. Uh, <coughs> thinking that way all the time. <coughs> um, and then I'll come back to this. So, um, so remember that if you have a P bundle, so, so <coughs> if you have a principal bundle over the manifold with some group G, <coughs> then you can always form, so this is a Lie group. <coughs> um, this is a, a bundle with typical fiber that group. So a principal bundle. <coughs> um, then you get associated bundles. So if you have V a representation of G, <coughs> then uh, you form these associated bundles. So, um, <coughs> so let's call it, I don't know, curly V or something. So this is G, uh, <coughs> so, sorry, P cross, and sometimes people put G here or you put the representation, it doesn't matter, um, <coughs> V, where that's the representation. And what this means is that you take the cross product of your principal bundle with your um, vector space that carries the representation of G, and you mod it by an equivalence relation. And the equivalence relation is that <coughs> P in here 
uh, comma v, right? So that's a typical element in here. Well, if you, <coughs> um, if you multiply this by some g in g, then this is equivalent to pg acting on v because it's a representation. <coughs> okay. So the, <coughs> the, the sort of favorite example, if you like, is you take p equals the frame bundle. So if you're on a um, smooth manifold, you, ha you have the, 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 f the bundle of um, all frames, so all linear frames. So, so, you, so this has fiber GLN <coughs> over the manifold. <coughs> and this is just telling you that um, you can think of an invariant vector field on the manifold as, as um, some section of, of uh, one of these associated bundles. So in that case, um, if it was just vector fields on the manifold, you would take F cross GLN RN. <coughs> and and this, this action of the group is just telling you how the, how the components of the vectors change when you move, move from different charts. <coughs> right? so, so this is the usual thing that you, you do with vectors um, with the frame bundle, but you can define it for any principal bundle and it, and it works just as well. So, Anyway, what is a section of one of these things? So <coughs> a section <coughs> of, of, of one of these associated bundles is equivalent to a function <coughs> on, the, on the principal bundle taking values in V, um, which is equivariant. <coughs> and the equivariance is that uh, if you take your element of P and you act on the right with G, then this function is the same as the representation acting with G inverse <coughs> to the left acting on the values of the function at P, right? So for functions which are equivariant in that way, they are the things that correspond to sections of your bundle, okay? And this, as I say, if you, if you find this, any of this uh, new or hard to understand, just play around with vector fields write them in components and in terms of the frame, and you'll see that this is what's happening. <coughs> okay, so in particular now we have this R plus bundle, we have a representation of it, so we can make an associated bundle, <coughs> and these things are there canonically. Okay, and if you unwrap what this equivariance means for this particular representation, we find that <coughs> sections <coughs> of here, uh, of this bundle, um, <laughs> break it or you'll break me, right? <laughs> so um, they correspond to uh, functions from <coughs> um, this principal bundle to R now, which is our representation, right? Such that <coughs> um, <coughs> F, um, and now we, we, we act with, uh, uh, with the representation, so, so rho W S onto X G S. <coughs> and, and this should be S to the W F X G X. <coughs> okay, so they're functions which are equivariant in that way. But of course, the way this acts on here, remember this is just F of um, X uh, S squared G X. <coughs> and so um, if, we, if we write this another way, it's saying that uh, the, this, this function upstairs at um, s squared g of x is equal to s to the w f g of x. Or if we write it in terms of, we could think of sort of sections, and, and what we would see is that f of omega squared g is uh, omega to the w sort of f of g. <coughs> so that's what the strange move is, right? This, the strange move... Is, 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 is we were representing, instead of it being a function, it was really the thing that corresponds to a section of this density bundle, but it's the, it's the equivariant function that corresponds to the invariant section. Okay? So, so when, when we do the strange move, what we're really doing is, is working with the, up, on the, uh, up on this bundle Q with these equivariant functions. <coughs> But we're pulling back, so, so we're taking sections of that using a choice of metric and pulling that back down to the manifold. Okay, so 
the moral is, as you can <laughs> tell that I'm getting to, is that we should really use um, these densities, <coughs> these invariant densities, instead of working with these um, kind of components of densities, which is what we do when we do the strange move. <coughs> Okay, there's one more thing I wanted to mention in relation to densities. Um, sorry to go on about densities, but they seem to be the cause of a lot of confusion uh, amongst even people who shouldn't be confused. So let me <coughs> uh, say one more thing. <coughs> and this, this relates to the fact that uh, even if you haven't done conformal geometry, you have heard of densities. <coughs> and so you're probably putting up your hand and saying, but what about these things I can integrate? <laughs> they were called densities too, right? So let's, let's relate them to those. So, <clears throat> so this is a kind of aside, but, but a, a useful one anyway. So densities <clears throat> <clears throat> on M, smooth. Okay, so let's take a smooth manifold with no metric, no conformal structure or anything, then <coughs> we have the frame bundle. As I said, from every representation of the frame bundle, you can form an associated bundle. So, so <coughs> this has fiber GLN. <coughs> um, and so we can, form, we can form line bundles <coughs> uh, like this. So we, we, we take the representation of GLN, which is determinant, take the determinant of our element of GLN, and just take its inverse as a multiplication operator on R. Okay, so that's a perfectly good representation. So this is some kind of line bundle, which is canonically there on a smooth manifold. <clears throat> and these are called one densities. I won't give it a notation because we won't use it much. So. <clears throat> So this is the bundle of one densities. So these are the things that you can integrate on a non-oriented manifold. So, <coughs> or, and of course on an oriented manifold. But <coughs> so, so what have these got to do with those densities over there? Well now suppose <coughs> that you have a, have a metric. Okay, so a pseudo-Romanian metric for instance. <coughs> then there's a canonical density. <coughs> that we usually call vol or something like that. So it's the volume density associated with the metric. Okay, so <coughs> in a local coordinates, this is given by the square root um, of the determinant of the components of G. Well, yeah. <coughs> so, <coughs> so what you see is that <clears throat> the volume, so this, but this is an invariant density, so it's an invariant section of that. It's represented by that in, in local coordinates. But then the volume uh, <clears throat> I probably have to put some sign in there, do I? <clears throat> Sorry. Modulus. <clears throat> so um, so, the, so this transforms, when we change it conformally, this transforms by a power of omega to the n. <coughs> okay, so a pseudo Riemannian manifold has a canonical one density, <coughs> but if you change your mind conformally about the metric, then it transforms like that. <coughs> Therefore, if we fix the conformal structure, <coughs> then there's a bijective map which takes one densities, call it phi, say, <coughs> and maps it to, <coughs> well, what's going to map to is functions on Q um, to R, which are homogeneous of degree minus N, which according to our equivariance means that these descend to densities of, of weight minus n. <coughs> okay, and this map just maps phi of x to <coughs> um, that divided by, by this thing. <coughs> okay, so this gives us an um, identification of 
well, of, of one densities with, with conformal densities of weight minus n, and more generally, if we take powers of this density bundle, so <coughs> minus w over n densities, this is densities in the sense of on a smooth manifold, <coughs> they can be identified canonically if you fix the conformal structure, notice that's important, um, with conformal densities of weight w. <coughs> okay, so one of the upshots of this is that conformal densities of weight w, if you make this identification, then they're also associated to the frame bundle. So, <coughs> so conformal densities have the same status as tensor bundles, so they're just among the things that are associated to the frame bundle. They're just, just uh, you know, on an equal footing, and it's this part that some people don't seem to understand. So, so you often find people thinking that t tensor bundles and, and even spinner bundles and so on are kind of real things, and densities are somehow a bit spooky or strange. <coughs> so, so they're not, they're just associated bundles as well. <coughs> And what's more, they, they're going to play an important role in what I'm about to talk about. <clears throat> okay, just as a point of notation, <clears throat> given a bundle B, any sort of vector bundle, um, we'll, we'll write um, B with brackets W like this, this will, this will be a shorthand for this tensor with the densities of weight W. <coughs> now, now that we love conformal densities, we just need to learn to work with them a little bit. Um, <coughs> so, I want to talk a little bit about dense, what I'd call density calculus on the conformal manifold. <coughs> so there's, there's not much of this, but there's just a little bit we need to absorb properly. So <coughs> first of all, so on a conformal manifold, <coughs> you get canonically <coughs> an object that I'll call the conformal metric. Okay, so you don't get a metric, but you get this thing called the conformal metric. Um, and that's because, um, tautologically, <coughs> we have this, we, we, by definition of a conformal manifold, we have this ray bundle Q, um, <coughs> and there's a, a function on it, which I'll, I'm going to underline this conformal metric, but there's a function on, on this thing, which I'll put a tilde on as well, <coughs> which... Um, which maps to, well, if I'm really correct, I'll say it's the pullback of uh, S2 T star M. <coughs> um, that, that'll map it then to a section of a bundle over, over this, um, <coughs> which takes uh, a point in here <coughs> and just gives you that, uh, the, the, the metric back. Okay, so it just gives you the metric. So, yep. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> good. Otherwise, it'd be a bit silly. Thank you. Not a question, but an answer. <coughs> Even better. So, um, now, <coughs> that you have this tautological map, but notice that it's homogeneous of, of, of weight 2, so, or degree 2. So, this is homogeneous because if you do uh, x s squared g of x, then that gets mapped to s squared g of x. <coughs> Therefore, this g tilde is homogeneous of degree 2. <clears throat> so we can think of it actually as a section of, um, so it's equivalent therefore to a thing <coughs> um, which I'll take the tilde off now, which is a section of uh, S2 T star M, <coughs> but, but taking values uh, in densities of weight 2. Okay, and you just have this canonically on a conformal manifold. So you have a kind of weight 2 metric, weight 2 conformal metric. 
<coughs> and by the way, um, <coughs> it's easy to see that this, this is the thing. So <coughs> um, if you take a sort of nth power of this conformal matrix, <coughs> um, then you can use it to contract away the indices <coughs> on the top exterior power of the tangent bundle squared. <coughs> and evidently, that will land in here. <coughs> so you can think of this also as the object which gives you the identity between densities and conformal densities. <coughs> okay, <coughs> Let, let's, we'll just remember that for in a minute. Then, <coughs> um, okay, so we have this conformal metric, and then <coughs> if you take a section of densities of weight 1, well, actually, these density bundles are oriented um, because the principal bundle is an R plus bundle, and R itself is oriented. And, and so, so, so this is an oriented thing, and there's a notion of positive sections. So, so I'll put a little plus down here when I mean positive sections of, of density bundles. <coughs> so if we take one of these things, then <coughs> sigma to the minus 2 times this conformal metric is a metric in the conformal class. <coughs> okay, because now um, <coughs> this, this, if you like, takes away the weight and you, you genuinely get a metric. By construction, of course, this, this conformal metric was, was um, kind of in the conformal class, if you like. <coughs> and then conversely, <coughs> a metric determines sigma in uh, densities of weight 1, positive densities of weight 1, by just the same formula, because you have the conformal metric, the restriction of that being positive means sigma is determined by the metric. And so we call sigma <coughs> or g as a choice of scale. So we think if we have a conformal structure, then we pick this... Uh, this density, um, and then that gives us our, our metric, our choice of scale. <coughs> okay, now, a reason that the conformal metric is, is quite useful um, is the following thing. So this is kind of calculus. Um, <coughs> so remember that... Um, if we pick, well, if we pick a metric G in the conformal class, then <coughs> this determines <coughs> a connection on densities of weight W by, <coughs> well, there's two ways we get a, this. On the one hand, I said that we can we, that we can think of densities as associated to the frame bundle. <coughs> so the levi sevita connection determines a connection on the frame bundle, therefore it determines a connection on all the associated bundles. However, <coughs> there's a more obvious way to get it and to get something in terms of <coughs> what the way I define conformal densities. So, I <coughs> so suppose I take some, some tau in here. <coughs> okay, so it's a, a section of densities of weight W. I define my connection by omega, uh, sorry, sigma to the minus w of the exterior derivative acting on, um, perhaps I want a plus w, on uh, sigma to the minus w times tau. Okay, so this is a density of weight w. This, is a, a, this power of sigma is then a density of weight minus w. <coughs> so this thing is just a function, so I can act, act with the exterior derivative and multiply by sigma again. So this, so th it's easy to see this gives a connection. <coughs> and then notice that with this connection, that by definition, sigma itself is parallel. <coughs> because you would just have sigma, sigma to the minus 1, which is 1. <coughs> okay. So now let's couple this with the levi sevita connection on tensors. <coughs> um, and then observe that we can then act with this coupled connection 
on the conformal metric because the conformal metric um, is a symmetric two tensor taking values in, in two conformal two densities, right? So, so the coupled connection <coughs> um, act, acts on this, <coughs> but this is just this connection acting on sigma squared g. So remember <coughs> the definition of oh, also the way that g is related to 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 this is that g was sigma to the minus two conformal matrix. So. So we have that. <clears throat> now I just said that by definition this connection makes sigma parallel. On the other hand, the levi sevita connection makes the metric parallel. So this is zero. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so, so we have this result. So the conformal metric <clears throat> is preserved by this coupled connection for all metrics in the conformal class. <clears throat> okay, so, so the, the conformal metric is parallel for any levi sevita connection coupled with this connection um, in the conformal class. Um, <clears throat> now, um, <clears throat> let's look at the star thing again. So <clears throat> the levi sevita connection acts here, obviously, because this is just some power of the tangent bundle. If we want to think of the levi sevita connection acting on this as an associated bundle, it's exactly by this isomorphism. <clears throat> on the other hand, <clears throat> if we use this coupled, so, so, so the, saying the levi sevita connection acts on here is just saying you act with the levi sevita connection here and you use the identification to say it's acting over there, right? But <clears throat> here we're saying with this coupled connection, this is parallel, so the, these are the same thing. So, so it's easy to, to stare at this and, and this observation to conclude that this just is the levi sevita connection. <clears throat> okay, so we don't have to say it's this coupled connection, it's the levi sevita connection, and the important thing is that for any metric in the conformal class, the corresponding levi sevita connection preserves this weighted conformal metric. So we can use the weighted conformal metric to lay, raise and lower indices without fear in our calculations. We can, we can start using that instead of the metric. <clears throat> and this has a sort of, um, has, a, has, a, has a, a sort of trivial benefit, if you like, that you don't get all these powers of omega around, right? So we, we take everything to be density valued all the time, even if we're going to work in a scale, even if we're going to work with the metric. <clears throat> so let me officialize that. So, so, <clears throat> so this thing and its inverse to raise and lower indices. <clears throat> so even, you know, in calculations where we're working with the levi sevita connection without danger, and so, from now on, the Laplacian will mean, <coughs> um, I'll use the inverse of the conformal metric <coughs> instead of the metric to contract the levi sevita connection. So even if with respect to a metric, so this is the usual levi sevita connection. So this will be my Laplacian, but I'm using this, this bold G, this underlined G, to contract it. This, and then <coughs> when I write J, <coughs> what I'll mean is Mostly, at least, J, A, B, P, A, B. So I take the Scouten tensor and I contract with the conformal metric. So this is now um, <coughs> in densities of weight minus two. <coughs> well, it's a section in that. <coughs> Even though, of course, I needed a metric to, to, to form these things. <coughs> okay. <coughs> but with this notation, then, the conformal Laplacian... So I'll just call it box instead of box G. Um, <clears throat> this is, is now the, the Laplacian in this sense, plus 1 minus N over 2 J in this sense. <clears throat> okay, so, <clears throat> um, so this is now a conformally invariant operator. Uh, 
<coughs> and it sends densities of weight 1 minus n on 2 <coughs> to densities of weight minus 1 on n on 2. Yep. I mean conformal now. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, so let me say that once and for all. Um, from now on, when I say density, I'll mean conformal densities. No, no, no. Not, not anymore. <laughs> not unless you make me. Yep. So, and, and on a fixed conformal structure, as I say, they're, they're essentially the same except the way you label the weight. <coughs> if you start varying the conformal structure, you have to be careful. <laughs> so, <coughs> okay. So, um, okay, so we can think of this as a conformally invariant operator which maps conformal densities of this weight to conformal densities of that weight. Okay? But to be clear, I really mean if you took, put different numbers here, you could say between densities of a certain weight and densities of a certain weight. There's, once you fix the conformal structure, there's really no difference between using densities and conformal densities except the numbers that you associate. You know, it's just a different power involved. <clears throat> okay. And then uh, similarly, <coughs> this AAB thing, which remember had this by weight 1, 1, um, dates densities of weight 1 to uh, trace-free symmetric <coughs> tensors of weight 1. And that's conformally invariant. These things are now well-defined on a conformal manifold. Right? They, they, that's the point. The, these are well-defined on a conformal manifold, which is what we wanted to get to. <coughs> All right. Um, okay, so 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 far we haven't got very far, but we know we know at least um, more or less what we mean by conformally invariant operators. Uh, you know what what we want to mean by invariant operators on a conformal manifold. Things like this, right? We would like to know, for instance, how to make all linear conformally invariant operators on a conformal manifold. Okay, we we actually more or less know how to do that. Um, <clears throat> we would like to, for instance, make all conformal invariants on a conformal manifold. And in odd dimensions, we know how to do that. And in even dimensions, we know quite a lot about how to do that. But there's actually, even with that simple question, there's still um, a very hard uh, unsolved problem. So, so there's a gap. So it's in dimension 4, for instance, we basically know the answer. Um, but once you go to dimension 6 and higher, we don't know how to make all conformal invariants on even dimensional manifolds. So even simple questions like that, there's still open problems. Um, and, and that's why, in one sense, you need to be very careful about developing um, as much <laughs> uh, technology as you can to, to solve these problems, because they're actually not easy. But <clears throat> anyway, just as a, as a parting shot on this, so, <clears throat> so with these densities, we have a nice way of describing how operators, these covariant operators, um, correspond to operators between density bundles, so they descend to operators on conformal manifolds. Um, <coughs> and from my, um, my formula here for how you make, <coughs> how you make this connection on densities, so, so notice that when you, so remember G is sigma to the minus 2 times the conformal metric, so replacing G conformally like that, <coughs> corresponds to replacing sigma with sigma hat, which is omega to the minus 1 uh, sigma. Okay, so using that, you can see how the levi sevita connection transforms when acting on densities. So, so this goes to one form, tends to those densities, so you have uh, grad hat um, on some density uh, tau, let's say, is grad g on tau plus w times epsilon times tau, where epsilon, as usual, is this log derivative of the conformal factor. Okay, so that's, so now we, we could add this to our collection of transformation formulae um, we had the transformation formula for the levi sevita connection on one forms, on vectors, now we have it on densities. So we can do any calculation for how 
um, the Levi-Civita connection transforms on any weighted tensor bundle and use that to do calculations. Um, as I say, uh, if you want to do higher order calculations, you really do not want to do that, but, but you could. So, um, all right, so I'll stop there, and um, next time we'll, we, we, we will really start <laughs> going into the promised land of, of finding ways of doing this without calculating that way. Okay. <laughs>